Hello and welcome to uh, UK Hydrographic Office hosted panel discussion. Today we'll be focused on autonomous navigation and I'm delighted to welcome uh, an esteemed panel, uh, starting with Dan Hook. Dan is Managing Director of Ocean Infinity. Katrina Kemp. Katrina is Smart Ships and Automation Policy Officer for the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. And Mark Casey. Head of Research, Design and Innovation at the UK Hydrographic Office. So I'm going to start with Dan. Uh, Dan, I have a couple of questions for you pertaining to the benefits of autonomous vessels and particularly what they bring to shipping and the wider blue economy. And in addition to that, um, if you could give us a little bit of insight into the innovations you are seeing that enable this change. Great, thanks, Alistair. Um, good, good questions. Um, so, uh, in terms of the first one, I mean, I, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to, to have been working in the unmanned boat um, industry, working on various sort of sizes and shapes of vessels for, for nearly 20 years. And I guess in every case, it's really important to weigh up the pros and cons of, of unmanned operations, or, or, or more recently, as we've referred to them as uncrewed operations. Um, but I think I'm, I'm confident and, and convinced that sort of over time, there has been a sort of a steady increase in the number of cases where there really is a true net benefit. Um, uh, and most notably, I think these can be the lowering of CO2 emissions. So quite often with robotic operations, there's a chance to use a slightly lighter or smaller vessel to achieve the same task and um, burning less fuel. Certainly, there's the opportunity to cut sort of offshore hotel power consumption. And this can be really quite significant on some tasks. There's the opportunity to lower offshore HSE exposure. Um, it, it speaks for itself, but it can be very significant, um, particularly in multi-boat operations and, and in certain areas of the world with, with challenging climate, sea states, or sort of social political challenges. Um, cutting HSE exposure is high on everyone's list. Um, and then finally, I think just overall operational efficiency. Um, I've certainly seen quite a few cases at sea now where unmanned vessels are, have offered a, an overall efficiency on a task, been able to gather more data, do the task more efficiently, more quickly. Some of this is from long endurance. Some of this is from algorithms and tools in software. Um, just an overall efficiency that comes with robotics is, is a pretty strong case, isn't it? And it's building more and more evidence. Um, in terms of the innovations that sort of enable this, this benefit to continue. Um, certainly in my work, initially with ASV and, and, and more recently with Ocean Infinity, um, we've always put a, a total emphasis on, on safety. Um, and I think I see a lot of opportunities for ongoing R&D innovation to, to further enhance this. A particular topic is um, the development of, of, of ever richer um, navigational models. So. Um, extra layers of information, extra means that, that can, the, the machines, the robots can interpret interpret that data. Um, clearly a big topic for the UKHO and, and this event. I think there's still a lot of progress to be made in engineering around communication optimization um, and how we integrate with these new satellite constellations becoming available to us. On the human side, um, and this links back to the, the comment about rich sort of world models, there's a lot of opportunity to improve how we do operational planning, training, simulation, um, and some of this links to opportunities like augmented reality. Um, there's certainly work to do across the board in remote systems with how we monitor uh, reliability, plan maintenance, uh, the management of onboard engineering systems remotely, um, some quite exciting developments going on in that space, and some huge data sets being generated for, for interpretation. So I think in general, the, the sort of uncrewed and, and lean crewed um, vessel industry is, is coming of age. Um, there's some exciting deliveries in the next few years. Um, and I think it's gonna have a huge sort of benefit towards this, this, this total blue economy. Thanks very much, Dan. Mark, turning to you, a couple of questions, if I may. Why can't autonomous vessels travel using existing navigational products? Uh, and second question, what data can support the safe and efficient navigation of autonomous vessels? Uh, yeah, great question there. If I take the first one, um, so the main area of concern centers around a lack of regulation or rules or standards relating to navigational data in an autonomous vessel. 
So whilst autonomous vessels will become aware of their surroundings and use sense and avoid technologies, these vessels still need to navigate, uh, get navigational data to go from A to B, avoid key areas or operate differently when entering a specific region such as a port. Uh, to suggest that autonomous vessels will be able to use current charts is inappropriate for the following reasons. ENCs are still fundamentally designed to be viewed and interpreted by a human being and are used to inform the mariner and help them make decisions uh, based on the chart information, their knowledge, their extensive training, what they see out the window and even the pitch and roll of the actual vessel itself. Uh, ENCs are made using traditional cartographic practices which can be subjective in nature and therefore they're only a representation of ground truth and we occasionally have data inconsistencies which mariners can identify and resolve. ENCs also suffer from horizontal inconsistencies, specifically edge matching issues, and we often see discontinuation of data when transitioning from one ENC to another, quite often as a result of different scale bands, but human beings again can identify this and resolve it. Uh, ENCs also don't contain wider contextual information that mariners need to make safe decisions, such as the information contained in sailing directions or radio signals, or even that which is sometimes displayed as notes on the edge of a chart. This information is really crucial to mariners as these notes often describe the kind of rules of the road, if you like, and describe restrictions or constraints uh, that mariners need to follow uh, when entering a specific region, such as a port. Um, we can't encode this data in an ENC because the, the standard is 20 years old and it's locked down. Therefore, new navigation data services that are rich in data and detail and can be machine readable and interpretable are needed. So if I pick up on your second point, at the UKHO, we've worked with a number of autonomous vessel operators, builders and system integrators to understand what data is needed moving forward. And it's become quite clear that there are a number of key data sets uh, that are crucial to safe navigation for an autonomous vessel. The most obvious one is high resolution grid and bathymetry, as opposed to the derived 10 meter interval, uh, interval contours that we show on charts today. Uh, another key element is tidal height and tidal streams. Today, tidal data is provided to mariners in applications where they click on a tidal station for an area that they're interested in and for a particular time. But an autonomous vessel will need machine-to-machine -machine data interoperability and require access to real-time data to ensure it can enter a restricted waterway or port. And finally, it will be involved uh, capturing a machine-readable format, all that textual, contextual data that I talked about, and making that available to autonomous vessels to ensure they are conforming to the rules of a specific region. And these new data sets will not only make navigation for large autonomous vessels safer, but all could also help route optimization, therefore lead to more efficient operations and reduce emissions and pollution. Mark, thank you for that. Um, one more question. How could we make navigational and other data more interoperable for autonomous vessels? So I think ultimately the answer has to be the use of maritime geospatial standards. And for me, the new IGOS 100 suite of navigation data sets could pave the way and facilitate autonomous vessel navigation. So the S100 suite of navigation data sets are designed to be interoperable with each other. Think of them as, as layers of data that together make a full enhanced picture of the maritime landscape. That said, the S100 standards are still really designed to be viewed by the next generation of ECTIS. However, they do have high degree of detail, such as S102, which is high resolution grid bathymetry, and S104, which allows for real-time tidal events, which could be made into machine-readable formats. These standards are still fairly immature, and we're a few years away from seeing these standards being readily available. But we're probably also a few years away from seeing large autonomous vessels sailing around the globe. And I think that these two areas of development are likely to start to reach a level of maturity that could complement each other. As I've mentioned in our work with autonomous vessel operators, there is a, an S100 equivalent to most of the data sets that we get asked for. So I've already mentioned S102 for grid bathymetry, S104 for tidal heights, but there's other key S100 standards that will, will be instrumental, such as S111 for surface currents, S122 for marine protected areas, S121 for maritime limits and boundaries. So indeed, S100 should address 8% of the problems I mentioned earlier with the current navigation products and services, allowing for innovation that kind of remaining 20%. And one area we're looking at is around position, navigation and timing or GPS denied environments. 
And at the UKHO, we've started some work with the University of Swansea to employ computer vision and machine learning to automate celestial navigation for deep ocean and the automated identification of visually conspicuous coastal objects to obtain accurate position of fixing when in close proximity to the shoreline. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, there's clearly a tremendous amount of hard work and progress uh, going into data development in particular around autonomous navigation, but it's probably a good time for a bit of a sense check uh, and bringing you in, Katrina. Um, how, how will autonomous vessels sit within the regulatory framework? What are you seeing? Um, obviously, when the regulations and guidance were developed, um, autonomous or remotely operated vessels were not considered. They weren't on the scene. Um, our job is to support industry and ensure that when these vessels are tested and operating, they do so safely. And as, as everyone's quite rightly said, the regulations aren't out there for that right now. So our approach is very much about providing exemptions or equivalents to those regulations. But obviously, we need to do more than that. And in the longer term, we need to, quite simply, update the regulations. Um, it's easier said than done. And but right now, we are working to update the workboat code, which looks at under 24 metre vessels. Um, and we hope to add an annex that specifically looks at what requirements are needed for those remotely operated vessels. Um, what we need to do is make sure that these vessels are safe, but we also need to make sure those regulations are flexible because as Dan and Mark have already explained, there is, there's a lot of development taking place. Things are still moving. We're not settled on where that technology is. So we need to ensure that any requirements we put into a regulation, such as the workboat code, have the flexibility to adapt and take into consideration new technologies that will be hitting the market and maturing in the next couple of years. Obviously, beyond that, the bigger picture is those vessels that are larger than 24 metres. What do we need to do there? What regulations do we need to be looking at? And also beyond remote operation, those more fully autonomous vessels, what considerations do we need to look at there in terms of data, communications, that machine to machine inoperability that was just spoken about? And it's worth highlighting, because this is the maritime environment, we also need to consider the international perspective. And we're working with IMO to incorporate autonomous vessels into the international regulatory framework, and not just within the maritime safety, but also the legal and the facilitation. And it's not going to be an easy task, but everyone I speak to all support that this is what needs to happen to ensure these vessels can operate and safely. Thank you very much, Katrina. Uh, there's clearly uh, a lot of very exciting development taking place. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for contributing to a really interesting and insightful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.